Hi, this is Steve from ACCAAPC.com. Question. Question 2 from your ACCA Paper P4 exam, June 2013. So let's have a look at the requirement then. Part A is to have a look at the different types of synergy, to try to distinguish them, and then apply that to the scenario. It's nine marks for this, so what I'm going to do is to try to say, firstly, what do I mean by synergy? Synergy is one plus one greater than two. Three types of synergy, including the revenue, the cost, and financing synergies, and trying to apply that to the scenario, okay? Write out nine points in relation to that. So before we actually dig into any further, I'm going to take you through the question then. So the question, let's read through the first of our paragraph over here. So Hayes Company is a public listed company in the production of highly technical and sophisticated electronic components for the machinery. There's a number of uh, diverse and popular products, an active research development department, and then significant catch reserves and highly talented management team who are very good in getting the products to market quickly. So what this actually means is Hive Company, if it is acquiring another company, combined together, it can share, for example, share the research and development department. Can, this can reduce the costs and it can use up its cash to try to fund another company to develop their product, of course, this will increase the you know, funds transfer between the companies, and hence this will be the financing synergy, isn't it? And this part of a new industry that Have Company is looking to venture is the biotechnology, which has been expanding quickly, and there are strong indications that this recent growth is set to continue. But Hive Company's limited experience in this industry, therefore it believes that the best way uh, to expand is to acquire a company. And Strand, okay, Strand's company is a private company operating in this particular industry. Uh, so that the, uh, uh, the Hive Company is going to acquire this company. The owner managers are highly skilled scientists, developed a number of techni uh, technically complex products, but have found it difficult to commercialize them. Okay, so from that perspective then, of course by acquiring this company, that the Have company can help this company to try to advertise its product and hence generate into more sales revenue and hence this will be the sales synergy. So the revenue synergy in other words. They have also been increasingly constrained by the lack of funds to develop their products. So from that perspective, after acquiring this company, of course we can use up the funds to help you to develop your products. And hence, of course, this will increase the funds transfer, which means it's the financing synergy. And on the same side is that because of the two companies combined together, they are more powerful. When trying to argue the costs, argue the you know imports the materials from the supplier, we can argue the prices down further. Okay, so this will be the cost synergy because reduce the costs further. So if these are sorts of ideas we can write it out in the exam. So looking at your answer directly. So for part A, is that given the real definition of what do I mean by synergy is one plus one greater than two three types of them, so detail that. Firstly, revenue synergy. So this means after the combination, business can increase their sales revenue further. In the scenario, it says that Have Company used the funds to help develop the products and get more sales revenue, and these two companies share the departments for the research and development, and some of the products uh, of this giant company's products will need the electronic components produced by the Hayes company and Hayes and hence the Hayes company can cross sales this kind of component electronic components to the strand company to earn more sales revenue. And also cost synergy, which means after the combination, business can save costs. In this scenario, it says combined entity have more power, argue the cost down when trying to import the materials. And also functions within the company can be eliminated into one, okay, which means benefit from the economic of scale, which means instead of having two accounting departments, we're going to have one accounting department. Financing a synergy, which means after the combination, business can use up the funds to in and also increase the debt borrowing. In the scenario, of course, paid company can use the funds to try to develop their products and the finance will be cheaper as well, okay, 
uh, given they have uh, more power uh, when trying to combine uh, together and also more equity as well so that we can uh, argue the cost down when trying to uh, borrow some money from the bank and also we can borrow more money uh, given the better position we, we have after the combination. So those are the points that you can write it out okay, in the exam. So we finish off the part A for this question. And let's have a look at part B then. It's the based upon the two different opinions expressed by Hayve and Strand Company calculate the maximum premium, the acquisition premium playable in each case. So from that perspective, so what do I mean by premium is the excess amount of money we're going to pay for you, either from the intangible asset or from the synergy we can create. Okay? So for example, they, we, you, you are actually worth $10, I'm going to pay for you $15. So the excess amount of $5 here will be because, firstly, maybe we think that the intangible asset you have is worth $5, but it's not reflected in your books. So that's why I'm going to pay for you for the excess of $5 uh, over here to, uh, to pay for you as a premium estimate. And secondly, we may think that, well, maybe after the acquisition, we can get the synergy, for example, increase the sales revenue by a further or $5, so that I'm going to pay for you 15 rather than 10 But this $5 here will be the maximum premium, because, for example, if you only increase the sales revenue after the combination by $5, I'm going to pay for you by $5, which means we can, we can get the benefit of 5 we spend out of 5 which means it eliminates to be 0 So from that perspective, this particular $5 here will be just the maximum premium I'm going to pay for you. Okay. So uh, we are going to have a look at this scenario then. So this will be uh, a little bit cheeky, as you say. So, next paragraph. If the discussion has been taking place about the possibility of the target company being acquired, the target company's manager has indicated that the owner is happy for the negotiation and if the target company is acquired, it's expected that managers would continue to run the company. So, uh, bear in mind, if you continue to run the company, maybe when we are trying to decide whether or not we're going to pay for you by cash, or pay for you by convertible bond, or pay for you by shares, of course, maybe you will accept the bond and also the shares for the convertible bond, which means it can be converted back into the foreseeable few years as an equity. If you decide to work for the company, of course, you'd like to hold shares of that particular company because you're expecting that the company's share price will increase at some point in the future. Okay, so bear in mind, so this will be uh, you know, the answer for the part three later on, or part C, as you say. Target company says that most of its value, so this will be the strong company, Okay, so bear in mind, as John Company said, most value will be the intangible asset, so therefore the premium payable on the acquisition should be based upon the present value to the affinity of the after-tax excess earnings that the company has generated in the past three years over the average return of capital employed. Okay, so from that perspective then, of course, the premium we're going to calculate from this John Company's perspective will be using something called the CIV approach. Okay, calculating the intangible value. So, uh, going to start a new page, to part B. From this John Company's perspective, then, so we're going to use the CIV approach to calculate the entire asset value in order to determine that particular premium. So how are we going to do that then? Of course, we're going to firstly calculate the excess return. Excess return from this John Company compared to the industry, or maybe other companies as well. Okay. So after we've done that, of course we can calculate that particular percentage. The next step we are going to do is to calculate the intangible asset value before tax. Which means we're going to use that particular percentage multiplied by the capital employed. Okay, multiplied by the capital employed. So let me write it here. It's the capital employed. Let me write it here. That particular percentage from the one calculation multiplied by the capital employed.
okay? Normally, it would be the average cap to employed. And after that, when we calculate this particular intangible value, of course, we like to take into account the after tax because the value to us is that you know uh, we have to pay tax, isn't it? So from that perspective, so we're going to calculate the intangible asset value after tax, and also it's set by the examiner as well. Is that we're going to take the value of this step number two? Multiply by 1 minus the tax rate divide by also by the discount factor as well to calculate the infinity value. Okay, so let's have a read through the question then. So here we are posing the question this John company's earnings before tax for the three years, and from that perspective, then we can plot them together, divide by three, so that we can get the average earnings before tax okay so the uh, we would like to you know compare that is the uh, uh, the let me draw you back here because this scenario is so, so complicated from your current examiner's perspective but the calculation is not that difficult so you can see here that the industries pre-tax return and cap to employees to be 20 percent you can see here the industry's pre-tax return on capital employed is to be 20%. So that we need to calculate what is the pre-tax return on capital employed for this joint company. So it's the pre-tax on capital employed. So I'm going to do this to try to say this joint company is that we're going to take the average EBT earnings before tax or profit before tax, you name it, divide by the average capital employed. So we're going to start working one and working two for this and minus the industry of 20%. Okay, so let me start a new page for this. Working one, okay. Working one will be calculating the average PBT or EBT if you like. Is that we're going to take the three figures plot together, divide by three, giving us 373. Okay? The working two would be the cap to employed. The cap to employed, we're going to use the long term debt plus the equity. So the equity will be the ordinary share capital plus the reserve. Okay? So, let me draw you back. So from this John company's perspective, we've got the ordinary share capital, reserve, and also we've got the non currency liability. So that we're going to plot these three figures together and divide by three. So we're going to say it's to be 400 plus 300 plus 183 plus 400 plus 300 plus 166 plus 400, plus 300, and plus 159. Divide by 3, given us 869. So we're going to slot these two figures into the first of our calculation here. Okay, so it's to be 373, divide by... A69 minus 20% giving us 23%. So which means while our company's uh, pre-tax return capital employees to be 43%, industry average is to be just to be 20%, which means the excess amount of return over here will be due to the intangible value. So from that perspective, then we're going to carry this down 23% into the multiply by the cap to employed, which is 800 and 69 giving us a total figure of 199 so as an intangible value before tax and we need to firstly calculate the tax effect and secondly discount it back so we're going to have a look at the question then okay so looking at the question we are told the question that the companies will pay tax at 20 percent and the annual cost of capital is to be seven percent so that we're going to say, firstly, 20% and 7%.
this figure will be 199 to spot forward over here. So from that perspective then, when calculating the, uh, you know, the future value for the, this particular intangible asset after tax is to be $2,276 million. Okay? So this is from this John Company's perspective as a premium, which means you need to pay for me for this amount of excess of money okay, for the intangible asset value. So what about from the Hay Company's perspective? So we are posing the question that, however, Hay Company says that premiums should be assessed on the synergy by the acquisition and the changes in the value due to the changes in the price to earnings ratio before and after the acquisition. So it seems to me it's, not, it's quite complicated, isn't it? But in fact, it's not. The, the, the computation is so simple. So, but the scenario is a little bit complicated, isn't it? So I'm going to do is to say the high company's perspective is that they say that the maximum premium would be the value of the combined entity minus the current value of the John company and the current value of the Hive company. So this would be the current value and this would be the new value. Okay, so and from that perspective then we're going to start working three and working four for these two values in turn. So working three is about the com Combined value. Okay, combined value. So, which means when trying to calculate the combined value using the PE ratio, of course we're going to take the profit of the tax multiplied by the PE ratio. But here, bear in mind, because you're not just calculating the profit of the tax per company, but also you need to account for any of this synergy that is benefited from from the acquisition. So, from that perspective, then we're going to say the profit of the tax plus the synergy and also multiply by the P ratio which is the new P ratio after the acquisition okay so go to have a look at it okay so going to have a look at it so um, let's say is that we've got the earnings before tax is to be of this company, of this John company in 2013, is to be 397, isn't it? So 397, we need to take into account the tax effect, which means we need to multiply by 80% to give us the net tax value. Okay, and also we've got the Hague company's earnings before tax is to be 1980, which means we need to multiply by one minus the tax rate, give us the net tax value, okay, after tax value. So from that perspective then, the new combined entity of those is that for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for this giant company is to be 397 multiplied by 80% which means 1 minus 20% of the tax rate plus the age company is 1980 multiplied by 80% so this, this giant company, this will be the age company. So what about the synergy then? The synergy we are posing the question is that you can see here, ah, the information has been slotted here. The annual after tax earnings has been increased by $140 million because of the synergy. So, from that perspective, then, so we're going to plot the synergy of 140 so that we're going to multiply by the new PE ratio. After the combination, the PE ratio will fall to 14.5. So, from that perspective, then we can use that. 14.5 so that it gives us a total figure of 29,603 okay for the combined value so what about the current value so the current value for these two companies is that firstly to the H company secondly to the S company and to the H company we are posing the question that uh, the share price of the H company will be $9.24 per share and we are also told any of the share capital as well. So it's to be $600 million in total and $0.25 per share and hence we can work out the number of shares in relation to that so that we're going to take the share price, multiply by the number of shares, giving us the total share value. 
So from that perspective, so we're going to say so the share price multiplied by the number of shares. So it's to be 9.24 per share multiplied by 600 million dollars divided by 0.25 dollars per share, giving us 22,176 million dollars. And what about for the S company then? So for the S company, we are not told any of these share prices of the S company, but rather we're going to use the PE ratio to calculate this. It is simply because we are posing a question that the profit after tax or profit before tax of the S company is to be 397. From that perspective, we can take into account the tax effect, which means we're going to multiply by 80% of that, giving us the profit after tax. And then we're going to multiply by the PE ratio, is that for 16.4, and it has been estimated that S company's P ratio is 10% higher than this, which means we can calculate that net effect. So, we're going to take profit of the tax multiplied by the PE ratio. Profit of the tax is to be profit for tax 397 multiplied by 80%. And for the PE ratio, for the PE ratio, we are toasting the question is to be 16.4 for the industry and we are 10% higher than this so that it gives us a total value of 5,717 million dollars so we're going to slot these three figures onto the face of a calculation so, okay it's to be 29,603 minus 22,176 that's 5,717 given us the maximum premium we're going to pay for them with regards to the uh, 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 with regards to the synergy is to be 1,710 million dollars okay okay so this is how we deal with the part B you can see the calculation is not 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 difficult at all because all of those has been covered in our tuition video you can see that but the problem bit about those part b is that the information are flowing around maybe you you will you will you'll be lost when trying to tackle this question okay so do make sure practice them and then get a clear mind of how to apply your concept into the practical scenarios so for part c again uh it's the you know, quite a similar question to what we've seen below uh, before in the tuition study. So let's have a look at this question then. Calculate the percentage premium per share that the target company shareholders will receive under each acquisition payment method and also justify which is the best one. So it's to be 10 marks for this. So I'm going to do is to try to say, well, if you look back to your question, there will be three particular options, three particular types of payment uh, options we can have okay for the target company only so we're going to focus upon the target company not the acquirer company okay so here's the thing firstly catch offer so when trying to tackle this kind, kind of question according to your pro forma in your study notes you can still remember that the uh, payment method either to the acquirer or to the target company if it is for the target company for the catch offer of course we're going to compare uh, that the catch offer with the existing share price we try to see if there's any gains or losses as a result of it and we're the question we offer you 5.72 dollars per share what about the existing share price? Okay, existing share price of the uh, S company. So the existing share price of the uh, company is that we are going to take that the total value of those, uh, you know, of of the S company we just calculated in the working number four. So they are going to take the total value from the working number four for the S company divide by the number of shares of the list uh, of the S company a total value in the notes number uh, in the working number 4 uh, we can see is to be 507 uh, 5717 
the number of shares of the S company, we're going to look back to the statement of value position, is to be 300 divided by $0.25 each. So that it gives us $1,200 million shares is to be 300 million divided by 0.25 each. So this divided by that has given us a total figure of 4.76 per share, which means you worth four, I'm going to offer you five. So that, of course, for the existing shareholder, they will have a gain of $0.96 per share. Okay? But here, we need to calculate that using percentage, which means in percentage, it will be $0.96 per share divided by the existing share price is to be $4.76 per share multiplied by 100, giving us 20.2% of gain. What about for the second offer? We're well, chosen the question that the second offer is to be cash offer and also the share for share as well. So this will be the complicated uh, part here. So it will be catch and share for share. Firstly, catch offer and share for share value compared to the existing share price. So that it can give us the gains or losses. Yeah. And we are told to the question that we offer you a catch price of 133. And we are told to the question that for every target company shares, every two target company shares, we're going to offer you a new share. So from that perspective then, for you, you have two, I'm going to offer you one. So that I'm going to use one to split into two, right? So from that perspective, what is my shares to you as the individual share value into your company? Of course, I'm going to say the Have Company share price. The Have Company share price, we are told the question is to be $9.24 per share. And for every two you have, I'm going to give you nine, which means for each share split into two, the nine becomes your shares. As a result of that, each of them will actually become 9.24 divided by 2, giving us $4.62 per share. Existing share price, 4.76, which is the same, giving us $1.19 per share. In percentage terms, Is that 1.19 divided by 4.76 giving us 25%. Okay, so what about the third one? We're told the question that this will be the catch and also convertible bond. Okay. The cash offer is to be 1.25. But what about the bond value per share? We'll compare that to the existing share price of $4.76 per share given us the gains or losses. So the bond value per share, we're told the question that uh, a cash offer for each share plus one one hundred dollars power value three percent convertible bond for every five dollars 
uh, known the value of the of your shares. So for every five uh, dollars of the value of your shares, I'm going to give you one hundred uh, of the convertible bond. And from that perspective, then what is the number of shares involved? So we are posing the question that the standard company share prices, uh, the ordinary share, the the default value terms share prices will be not point twenty five dollars uh, per share. And from that perspective, then we can work out the number of shares is to be five dollars divided by not point twenty five, giving us a total figure of I'm not sure. Uh, let's calculate that. It's to be uh, twenty, isn't it? Yeah, twenty. So twenty shares. Okay. Uh, which means for every five shares, it will be uh, five dollars worth shares. It will actually worth the number of shares is to be twenty. And I'm going to give you one hundred, which means this will be the total value for the convertible bond of one hundred divided by the number of shares equivalent to the five dollars, so that can gives us the bond value per share. Okay. So this is about your uh, your mathematic bit. Okay. So let's look at it here. It's to be one hundred. Divided by the number of shares is to be five dollars divided by not point twenty five. Give us five dollars per share. So gain as a result of this is to be one point forty nine dollars per share. So that the premium uh, in percentage is that we're going to take one point ninety four divided by four point seventy six. Given us 31.3%. So we can see here from the first option is to be 20.2, second one 25, and third one is to be 31.3, which means maybe the target company will accept the third option rather than the first two. But let's have a look at the common part here, directly looking at your uh, answer then. Firstly, the third option offers the highest return, but uh, it will be, you know, it's a convertible bond, which means at some point in the future it will be converted into, into shares. And hence, that the share value at that particular point is to be, for example, take into account today's share price is to be 9.24, multiply by, we are told the question that it will be converted into 12 shares or redeem at par. So if I'm going to convert that into this whole share, 12 shares, which means it's 110 uh, worth of money taken into account today's share price. And uh, if I'm going to redeem that, if I'm going to pay for you uh, 100, uh, which one will you choose? Of course, maybe some of you would choose 100, maybe some of you would choose 110. It depends. Maybe you have lots of cash with your company, of course you can redeem that by cash. But maybe you haven't got enough cash within your company, otherwise you are going to say that allow them to convert into shares, we, we are not going to do anything about it. So it will depend. And the cash and share should, for share offer will allow the shareholders to become the Have company's owner and they, they can sell the shares immediately. And if this is the case, because the second option is to be 25%, if I'm going to allow you an option to sell your shares immediately, this will lead to you know, sell the shares quickly so that the share price will decrease and decrease and decrease. As a result of that, maybe the net return, as a result of this particular situation, will be less than the 25% that we've just calculated before. And if I'm going to give you cash directly, maybe you can see, well, it is quite secure to doing so, for doing so, okay? So you're going to receive the cash on hand, of course, yeah, it will be quite secure because it's the cash. I can use the cash to do whatever I want rather than suffering the risk. So that it will depend upon different aptitudes to risk and also other factors to accept which uh, kind of option you're going to have. And also, from the scenario, we are, we, we, we've seen, as I've talked to you before, for the target company shareholders and managers would like to work within the company and hence, maybe, they're going to choose the cash and convert for bond offer because they think that at some point in the future the share price will increase as a result and hence, this will, uh, they will, they will have benefits out of it. Okay, so those kind of points that we like to comment is to be five marks for the common part and five marks for the calculation part. Do make sure write five points in the exam, that would be enough. Okay, so this completes our question 
on the June 2013 exam question number two of your paper P4.